we'll record that. Let's um, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, you've gathered us uh, together as a congregation, but also you gather us into uh, families uh, where it is your will, and you join husband and wife, and they um, grant blessings of companionship um, and children, um, but also marital relations. We ask that you would bless all the marriages of our congregation, but that you'd also be with those who are, who are single or who are widowed or divorced, uh, and give them the comfort of your peace that is the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a heads up what's going to come. Um, this is, I mean, chapter seven is kind of a rough chapter. <laughs> Actually, chapter five and chapter longer, six were two. longer than most of the others. It is longer, but I don't, I don't know that we have to do a lot of detail on it. I think I can actually, just with a few grammatical notes, um, really bring some clarity to the reading of it so you can kind of see what he's doing. And, uh, and then a little bit of context, I think, will help as well. And uh, so, but just to recap a little bit, back in chapter five and then the end of chapter six, we were dealing a lot with sexual immorality. And uh, uh, we, in chapter five, it was the, um, you know, the, the man who mother, married his mother-in-law or his, or his stepmother, we don't know which, but something like that. And, you know, how disastrous that was within the community. So we had this like, I don't know what you want to call it, like a Mm, licentiousness is the word that comes to mind license right that like you do whatever you want because you're a christian now and paul had to clamp down on that because that's not true right you're using your freedom right. as a cover for sin that's not a good idea right um, and then he deals with it more in chapter six i can't remember yeah he talks about all sorts of you know um immoral behavior suing brother you know that means another Christian within the congregation, not resolving those things with internally. Then all the other like besetting sins, we call them in verse nine, you know, the fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revelers, extortioners, these people, you know, who are like, um, who do these things repeatedly. Uh, it becomes like part of their identity, who they are. And he says, no, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. You're a baptized Christian. That's not who you are um, anymore. Um, so don't go back to that, and don't be deceived that you can go back to those things. All right, and then the stomach for foods, and we talked, th this bit about the food for stomach and the stomach for foods, remember, I, I think I mentioned last week, yeah, I did, that um, maybe this was like a saying in Corinth, and Paul is just quoting it, and then, that could be. <laughs> rather than it being like a, a, a teaching, we have to be careful with Paul in this letter, because it seems like, in a number of places, he doesn't tell you, in some places he does, he he quotes almost sarcastically like a, a, a common saying among among the corns he was there three years so he'd pick up a lot of their like you know inflections and euphemisms and that kind of thing it's like like a um, luke tonight he said dragon but like i learned right away right away that's not how you pronounce an a in in wisconsin you say it's dragon not dragon just it's a nuance but like it really shows where you're from on how you pronounce your A's, or you could be from Chicago, which is a, even a different A entirely, <laughs> right? Um, so, I, yeah, I think he's quoting a saying, and he's going to do the same thing in chapter seven, where there's this expression where you're like, what? That doesn't make any sense, Paul, because he contradicts it in the next sentence. But that's, that's the reason, is he quotes the saying, and then he responds to it. But he does, there's no quotation marks in Greek, and he doesn't tell you who he's quoting, because maybe it's just a common saying. So food is for the stomach, and stomachs are food, but God will destroy both of them. Well, okay, but sexual immorality, um, you know, does actually hurt your body, unlike, you know, food, that kind of thing. All right. And then, of course, he talks about um, being joined to these prostitutes, which is a common thing in Corinth because the temple prostitution was a big deal. And this comes up again in seven, chapter 7 in that, um, you know, there are those who are forsaking marriage, and they're thinking then, you know, if they're not married, then they can just, you know, they can, they can go and, and have this temple prostitution and it's just fine because they're not destroying their marriage. They don't have a marriage. So it's like, I, I can just imagine Paul when he's reading all the things that are being reported to him, you know, he just wants to pull his hair out. It's like, <laughs> oh, he was there three years. He thought he like, they had better groundwork than this. And I gave getting, you one job to do and what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, right, exactly. 
So, so this statement here at the end of six will just lead us right into seven. All right, so flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the, is the temple? And remember, your body, referring your as plural there, so it's the, it's the body of Christ, the church, is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. Again, your, plural, right? For you all were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your, y'all's body, and in y'all's spirit, which are God's. All right, so we're talking about how, we talked about this, I think, the last couple of weeks then, that sexual morality has this way of, um, well, being really one of the, the main sources of, of, of uh, not contention, but, um, you know, when, when congregations really go wrong, you know, there's an affair, or there's, um, you know, somebody who, who's caught, oh, I don't know, like pedophilia or something, right? Or, or, you know, porn on the church computer or something like that, right? And it just destroys the, it can destroy the congregation or at least bring great harm for a great period of time. And also, just like we we're talking about with, the, <laughs> with medical authorities, right? It can destroy the pastoral authority as well for a long time because that trust between pastor and congregation can be broken if, if that's where the sin lies. And then, you know, whether it, it might take a generation for it to even be restored where people, you know, trust the pastoral office again in the preaching of the gospel. Right. All right. So um, now, so this is an interesting expression. He's going to use this a couple more times um, uh, within the book. Now he's like, okay, laid, I've laid six chapters of groundwork. I've responded to some very specific things. But now I just want to speak more broadly and talk about some of the things that um, these people have you know, written to me about that are happening in the church. And before we read that, this, chap this verse one is actually probably... It's not the key verse to understand, but it is key to understand this expression here. Because uh, it, it's caused all sorts of problems um, in the interpretation of this whole chapter and, and Paul's direction there. So this, this saying, um, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And you can just imagine where that goes, right? <laughs> um, the Roman church says, well, then that means celibacy is, is better than than marriage and that all marriage is sinful. That's actually what the, especially the medieval Roman church taught, that it was better to not marry. Uh, they also quote Paul on that, which he'll say in a few minutes, right? Um, so the question is whether or not this is Paul, you know, Paul speaking truthfully, or if this is Paul quoting another, one of those Corinthian statements. And given what we know about the philosophical um, underpinnings that are happening in Corinth, there's basically two worlds. And it's like Luther talking about, you know, riding on the horse and, you know, the drunk man falls off on either one side or the other side. <laughs> and that's how people are. They're, 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 they're like trying to ride a horse, but they're drunk. And so they either fall off on the side of do whatever you want. Your body is, you know, yours to use however you feel, see fit, right? or it's a cage, or, you know, it's, it's, it's less than the spirit. So that's the one ditch, which we talked about a couple times, many times. The other ditch is, is the complete opposite, which is this, what's called asceticism. You know, and that's the, uh, if you want to think of, like, within the Christian tradition, it's, that's the monastic life. It's better not to marry. It's better um, not to have any kind of sexual relations. It's not to, uh, or to, to bear children, or, you know, those things have all gone away and better to live the, the life where you live in the, you know, ivory tower and, <laughs> you know, and you're in isolation and it's just you and God's word and prayer and meditation. You know, that's, that's the highest, you know, state of life. And so, the, you know, the, those are like two opposite extremes, right? And not at all the same. I was thinking about, um, I have to find it here, but it's actually, it's actually what the, the, the Roman Catholics say uh, when, it, when you, in their right, when you become a nun. I have to find it, though. It's just, it's, I was reading this, I'm like, wow, that's really incredible. They actually just come out and say um, that to be a nun is, a, is to be like a higher class Christian, basically. Hmm. I don't know if I can find it quick enough. Yeah, yeah I'm not seeing it quick enough. I thought I remember where it was, but, but I don't. Oh, maybe I went too far. Hold on. Go back. Oh, yeah, here it is. All right. 
According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the consecration of a nun constitutes her as a, quote, sacred person, a transcendent sign of the church's love for Christ, and an eschatological image of the heavenly bride of Christ and of the life to come. The consecrated life is described as the narrower path, right? The narrow gate, Jesus says. The narrower path and those on it, quote, bear striking witness that the world cannot be transfigured and offered to God without the spirit of the Beatitudes. Uh, which is really kind of incredible. Now, the, the apology to the Augsburg Confession, um, actually, to, you know, celibacy was a big issue for the Reformers, for Luther and the other Reformers, mandatory celibacy, right? So neither Christ nor Paul commends virginity because it justifies, but instead because it gives more time for praying, teaching, and serving, and is not so distracted by household chores. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7.32, which is towards the end of the chapter, the unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, right? So that the idea is not like, you know, celibacy is a higher virtue, um, but that celibacy has some certain advantages. I had a, um, a celibate um, professor at the seminary, and one of the advantages that he had is that you know, with the sing he spent lots of time with the single students because he could, like, he wasn't, he didn't have a family to take care of. And so he'd just have them over for dinner and, you know, they'd smoke cigars on the back porch. I mean, it was just fun. Yeah. So he could befriend these guys. So they weren't alone, um, um, but also, you know, then teach them, you know. And it was very interesting, very interesting. But, but it's not commanded here as a higher virtue. All right. So that first statement, I think, is important. I, I'm going to suggest that it is a quote and not rather, you know, a, Paul saying this is the truth here, that it's good for a man not to touch a woman. And we'll talk about Paul's marriage. Um, now, you read the whole chapter already? Is that what you said, Don? Or you no, at least saw no. how long it was? Usually, usually we do. Usually I do read ahead uh, before each Bible class, but uh, for chapter seven, I have not read ahead at all. Okay. Yeah, it is long. And like I said, I don't, I don't actually want to cover the whole thing. But I do think um, maybe before we read the beginning of the chapter, we should read these verses that you see highlighted there, seven, 17 to 24, um, because they sit right in the middle. And this happens often in the Bible. It's different than uh, they don't think with the same kind of logic we do, or they don't speak with the same kind of logic. Because we often do like, we'll tell you our point or, or our, our main theme. And then we'll give you three points and then we'll go back and we'll review the points to, to reemphasize the main theme again, right? That's how we do things. That's not how the Bible works often, especially the Hebrew way of thinking. They'll put the main point <laughs> in the middle and they work towards it and then they work back out from it. All right. And you'll see this, especially in the Psalms. And sometimes you'll actually see if you have the main point in the middle, you'll see that the points on either side mirror each other. And they mirror, and they mirror, and they mirror, you know, going back out from the main point. So the first thing you hear is often very similar to the last thing you hear in a section like this, when there's a central idea in the middle. And I actually didn't look to see if that's true. <laughs> I probably should have. Um, but, you know, Paul deals with all sorts of different kinds of, um, you know, marriage and then everything that kind of works around marriage. Um, but this at the middle, I think, will explain it. So let's read that first. How about, how about you read? Uh, 17 to 4, 24, and we'll talk about that first. But as, <clears throat> but as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can be made free, rather use it. We just got a message on our screen saying your internet connection is unstable. <laughs> it covered up the text. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed, freed man. 
Likewise, he who is called wild for you is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Okay. All right. Yeah, that last, that last kind of central point, I think, is the important one to note. Um, he says, Brethren, let each of your brothers, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Or state is a fine translation. I think ESV has, let's see what ESV did. Oh, whatever condition each was called, therefore let him remain with God. So it's a little bit different. Uh, but the idea is, this: uh, Luther calls this the station. Remain in whatever station of life you're in, right? So if you're married, stay married. If you're, um, you know, divorced, stay, di well, actually, he doesn't say stay divorced. He says reconcile, uh, if possible. Um, if you are single, remain single. And, and it begs the question then, because he's saying, actually, it doesn't, the problem is, is that being married or not um, isn't a spiritual thing at all. I mean, it is, it has a spiritual component to it, right? But it, it doesn't ultimately matter as far as your salvation goes. Think about like what he says in Galatians, you know, there's neither slave nor um, free, there's no, neither Greek nor Jew nor Greek, there's neither male nor female, there's... And you could just extend that farther. You could say there's not, you know, married or unmarried, or not, you know, divorced or undivorced. You know, there, there, there's Christian. There's one who's been baptized into Christ, who's forgiven in Christ and lives freely in Christ. And we kind of get hung up on that because we like to attach our identity um, to what we do. All right. So like Karen, I mean, you're a banker. No, you're retired. But you're a banker. <laughs> I don't know. I, my mom, she's a librarian. All right. And, you know, she'll, to a lot of people, especially her former students, she'll always be the librarian. Or, I mean, we have retired teachers in our congregation. They're, they're you know, people have a hard time calling them by first name. They're always teacher, right? Or, or Mrs. What, or Mr. Whatever. So um, we, we attach our identity to our vocations, to, to our calling, the things that we do in our life. And that can also be bad, right? Because, you know, like Paul said back at the end of chapter six, well, you were a thief. Do you want to consider yourself a thief anymore? <laughs> That's not a good thing, right? Consider yourself as one who's been washed, who's been sanctified, who's been justified in Christ. All right. I disabled something on my network in hopes that maybe that'll give us more bandwidth. So we'll see if that helps <laughs> on my end. I don't know. It can't hurt. <laughs> no, it's not really making it better. Well, I also wanted to do it because uh, Anne's got a conference call later on. So I think we'll be done before then. Anyway, uh, let me see. So, so he uses the example here, just like he does in Galatians 3, I believe. I think it's chapter 3. About, you know, circumcised or uncircumcised, it actually doesn't matter. Not for the Christian. Um, so you think about how, like, he handled um, Titus. I mean, Titus was a Greek, and he wasn't circumcised. Um, whereas Timothy, uh, his mother was a Jew, his father was a, was a Greek, but his mother was a Jew, and he had him circumcised um, because he was going to be he was going to be ministering to Jews, and he was a you know of Jewish heritage himself, and so the circumcision it didn't it doesn't actually save him, it doesn't do anything for him spiritually, but there was no reason to cause offense by him being uncircumcised in that community, All right? So that he uses that example here um, to actually help us understand what he's been talking about and then what he's going to be talking about, right? Let's not make too much of something that actually isn't, isn't, isn't that big of a deal. Uh, the other problem, well, you have the same thing with slavery here too, right? Um, you know, if you're a slave, stay a slave. I mean, what does that have to do with your salvation in Christ? Um, or if you're, if, yeah, I mean, that's what he's talking about. You're, you're already, you're gonna be Christ's slave anyway. And so he, he actually, Paul gives that counsel, or it's not Paul. No, I, I never get this straight. There's the book of Philemon, and I think Philemon is the master, and Onesimus is the slave. I think that's how it works, or it's the other way around. Onesimus is the master, and Philemon is the slave, or the, you know, the preacher. Whoever the slave is, he's counseled in Philemon. It's a very short book, um, just to stay with your master and serve him be a Christian slave. 
And we think of that and it's like, that doesn't make any sense. And the reason is, is that we live in America, I think, <laughs> where, you know, if you're, we, we've been, we've been off on like the, um, uh, what are those folks called? I'm trying to think here, the, you know, the guys who went around preaching, um, not Billy Graham, but long before that. The guys who told you that like, if you, if you just follow Christ, then, then he's going to, he's going to straighten out everything that's wrong in your life. You know, and you're going to get a good job and you're going to marry and you're going to have kids and, you know, you'll be wealthy and, you know, healthy and all that stuff. The prosperity gospel, as we call it. Yeah. And, and there's no promise of that in the Bible. Maybe in a spiritual sense, but, but not in a physical sense. And uh, so, yeah, Paul says, just stay where you are. <laughs> Do what you're doing. Um, you know, wherever the Lord has put you, just sit put, stay put and be a Christian there, which is, is kind of. Again, it's, 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 it's very much anti-American in this sense, is that there's no, you're not like trying to elevate your status in life. Um, the Christian it should be content to just stay where they are. Then there's a lot of counsel surrounding that then, both a little bit before this and especially after this section, where, you know, I mean, going to a church where you've got wealthy landowners and then you have slaves, not American-style slaves, but you know, people who are in, you know, in, in indentured servitude for, I don't know, maybe they owe their master 10 years of service before their debt is paid, something like that. And both, all those people are going to church together. Or, or there's a wife with kids, but it, her husband doesn't believe, so he stays home. So it's just mom and the kids come to church. Of course, we understand that. We have that. <laughs> or the other way around, just dad and the kids or something like that. And so that's part of the situation that's going on there too, where they have converts, but not both, not both spouses don't convert. Only one of them does. All right. So anyway, so this is kind of that, I think this is the central idea in the chapter and I'll help us understand the rest of it. Good so far. Good. All right. Let's go back to the beginning. So um, again, I'm, I'm going to suggest to you that he starts off with this saying from, it's just counts, uh, just a, a common saying in Corinth. Um, among the, the, what did I call them? The ascetic types. That's A-S-C-E-T-I-C. -E these, the, these are the people who like forsake all, you know, wealth and marriage and, and any earthly attachments. And they just live for the higher spiritual reality. Right? The monk or the nun, the nun or the um, John Lennon going to India or something. You know? yeah. <laughs> or Elon Musk, who's selling all his properties in, in, in California. He'll still be incredibly wealthy, so it doesn't really matter. But yeah. <laughs> all right, so uh, let's read this this block here. Uh, what is that through verse nine? If you would, starting uh, starting at the beginning of seven, though. No? Yeah, it is. It is, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again so that satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control but i say this as a concession not as a commandment for i wish that all men were even as myself uh, but each one has his own gift from god one in this manner and another in that but i say to the unmarried and to the widows it is good for them if they remain even as i am but if I, but if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. All right, no burning with passion, no Valentine's Day or something, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we talked about sexual immorality. That was back in chapter six, and then he brings it up here again. So I don't think he's he, he's dealing with some specific things. Hey, welcome, Ron. Oh, I think my microphone is a little bit off again. <laughs> Oh, no, we hear you fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we hear you fine. There, there's internet issues, apparently, but, uh, but I can hear you fine. All right, as long as you can see and, you, and we can hear you. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so sexual morality again, chapter six. Now he continues that idea, but he's having some very specifics in this church. And I said that, you know, in addition to 17 to 24 being kind of the, the central idea, just stay where you are, be a Christian in the life that you have right now. The context here is actually probably really important, not just of, you know, those two ditches between the people who say, you know, flee everything that has to do with the flesh and those people who say, just live the life, whatever you want in the flesh, because it doesn't matter. There, there does seem to be a question that comes up later in the chapter about um, what's going on around them in the world. And there's a historic note, I just have to find it here, this commentary that I thought was really helpful. All right, because he says in verse, you'll have to look, we'd have to look ahead here. But he says that there's, a, there's an impending distress. Yeah, present distress in verse 26. I think that this is, a good, is good in view of the present distress. And everybody's like, well, what present distress? What's going on in Corinth? Because he hasn't mentioned that before. Um, but I think it helps us understand what's going on here, too. Is that there's numerous um, evidences of a food shortage of between the 40s and 50s. You know, like you go to the grocery store and you can only buy three packages of meat. Or something like that. I mean, I laugh about it. But it's true. Um, you know, some kind of food shortage. There, there, that, there were important epigraphic evidence concerning Tiberius Claudius Denippus, who was responsible for, the, for grain during three shortages in Corinth. One of those occasions had been placed during Gal, Gallio's uh, Prancolship, Prancolship, excuse me, of Achaia in AD 51. And you can read about that in Acts 18. Another seems to have preceded Gallio's term and Paul's first visit to the city, with the third being placed later. So before Paul was there, while Paul was there, and then after Paul was there, there were three different food shortages that affected Corinth. Um, and it seems like there was actually a great deal of what we would call poverty because of that. Um, and then, then this Denippus, Claudius, uh, what a Tiberius Claudius Denippus, um, seems to have finally resolved it. And then they put up a statue and we have the statue of him. And it, it has an inscription thanking him for his services. So, so I mean, that would kind of, this would kind of make sense. It, if, if things had gotten really rough there as far as food shortages, you know, but you had the Jews saying that you had to marry, for example, uh, which the, the rabbis taught that. It's not in the Bible, but the rabbis taught it. All right. Well, it would make sense that Paul would come along and say, you know what, you know, you can hold off on marriage unless you have to, <laughs> because, because you can't control yourself and you're burning with passion. You know, you're 18 year old and your hormones are raging, you know, <laughs> go ahead and marry. But if you don't need to, because, you know, it's not a great, it's just not a great time to get married. And, and that seems like, I guess, terribly worldly or secular, but I mean, it's also being responsible, right? If you can't provide for, for your wife, go get a job. Right. But if you can't get a job, maybe maybe it's not time to get married yet, you know, until you can provide for one another. And uh, of course, today we use that to say, well, you can't I guess you can't get married until after you get out of college and you've got a dog and a car and a house. I don't know. Like, that's not how we did it. We didn't have anything. We just got started and we just started working. I was like, how do you do it? All right. So that I think that might make sense that if there was a famine. Um, they might prohibit them. And there's actually an Old Testament case that Paul might be drawing on here because, again, never in the Old Testament does God command celibacy. It's never commanded. And it's not commanded in the New Testament either by that, by that token, right? To not marry, to be intentionally either a virgin or celibate, not married. Like, uh, there, as a matter of fact, there's a great deal of instruction to say like if the widow is left alone, then, then the brother of her deceased husband is to marry her, right? I mean, God seems very concerned that people uh, remain in marriage relationships because that, there's a, it's protection. It's also um, you know, obviously companionship, but there's that providence, right? That's how God provides for us, uh, provides for children, for example, is, is with um, mom and dad. But there's one exception, <laughs> and I think Paul might be drawing on this. Um, which is Jeremiah, um, the prophet Jeremiah, who was a commanded actually not to marry. And you can read about it in Jeremiah 16. Maybe we should just go there. It's only a couple of verses. So maybe it's worth jumping there. 
I'll do that quickly. Jeremiah 16. Yeah, Jeremiah's lifestyle. <laughs> oh, people. That's, that is not a Bible term. Lifestyle. <laughs> anyway. It's not, it's not, we're going we're gonna to see him in the, oh, I don't know, Us Magazine or something here. Anyway. The word of the Lord also came to me saying, you shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. And here, here's why. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters who are born in this place, and concerning their mothers who bore them and their fathers who begot them in this land. They shall die gruesome deaths. They shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried, but they shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. They shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their corpses shall be meat for the birds of heaven and for the birds um, or beasts of the earth. So um, he's preaching in, near Jerusalem, and it's going to fall to the Babylonians. All right. And this is, he's not going to marry and he's not going to bear children um, as a sign to them under instruction from the Lord. He commands them to do this. Right. Now, this is quite a bit different than, say, Hosea, whom God commands to marry, um, but they're to marry a prostitute of all people. So uh, we have to be careful about like taking a, a, a one time command and then saying, well, that's the rule. Right. <laughs> No. All right. Uh, why did I bring all that up? Oh, the context matters, I think. So if things are going kind of rough in the church, plus we know there was that guy who married his mother-in-law for whatever reason. We, doesn't, we don't know. We just know it's abhorrent, both in Roman law and Jewish law and, of course, by Christian standards. Um, and then there's all this other sexual morality and there's the temple prostitution. And, and, and Paul's just like, I almost get the sense he's saying, you know what, just just don't do anything, and, and then we'll work it out when I get back to you, which he promises he'll come and visit them again, <laughs> or he'll write to them again, you know, or just, just, lay, just, you know, what do we say? Cool your jets, calm your horses, something like that. <laughs> take a time out. <laughs> yeah, take a time out. Um, a, lot of, a lot of helpful things, though, in here, all right? Um, by the way, Paul, he, he's unmarried at this point. I think that's pretty clear in the text. But that doesn't presume that he's been celibate. Um, he does refer to, to uh, he's probably a widow, a widower is what, uh, or a widow. Actually, the Bible only has one word, which is widow, but we'd say a widower, right? He's right. probably a widower. His wife's probably deceased, but um, that's just guess. Um, he's not divorced. Uh, she may have left him. I think this is actually, I, I think this is an interesting idea. I don't, we don't have any evidence for it. Um, but when he was converted by the Lord, you know, on the road to Damascus, um, she may not have come along for the ride, you know, because he was a Jew of Jews, and now um, he was going to go basically live, you know, a life of poverty and, and oppression, be the, be the very kind of person that he was opposed to before, you know. And you can imagine that kind of lifestyle change. I don't know, maybe his wife wouldn't come along for the ride. So that's a possibility, too, I think. Um, but he does know something of marriage. Of course, every, every Christian knows something of marriage. This is the other thing. We act as if like, oh, well, we can't say anything about marriage because the world has changed and we don't know what to do. And it's like, have we not read Genesis 1, Genesis 2? I mean, that's what Jesus quotes, right? Do you not know that in the beginning he made the male and female? And then, you know, don't you know that what God has joined together, let not man separate? I mean, it's, it's been around since the beginning. I mean, Moses wrote it. And have you just lost, lost sight of this? Um, so, so Paul acts as if that. Okay, what was the other thing I said, Don, at the beginning? I was going to give you a couple ways to help understand this chapter. One was context. One was those central verses. So verses 17 to 24. Here's the third thing. Here's the third thing. Paul speaks to the church in two different ways in this, in this chapter. He speaks with, with, grammatically, it's called the imperative so sometimes he speaks with an imperative voice, and that's usually translated as let, as you see like in here in verse 2, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife. Um, now, when we do imperative voice, we don't translate it this way. Because uh, an imperative is a command. So, so the, I, the, I don't know why New King James does this. I think ESV translates it the same way. Um, each man, oh no, they don't. Look at how they do it. Each man should have his own wife 
and each woman her own husband. Should. Right? Now, that's usually what we call subjunctive voice. Like maybe, kind of, might. Right? But the, it's, it's imperative. The way to translate this as an imperative is each man must have his own wife. Right? And each woman her own husband. Well, that's, of course, that's, that's right. That's what the Bible taught from the beginning of the book, right? You know, that a husband has a wife, and, and that's, you can't have other things in the marriage. There's no polygamy. That, even though they practiced polygamy in the Old Testament, it wasn't the way God had uh, ordained it from the beginning. He just tolerated that, that behavior from his people, right? Um, oh, here in ESV, you notice they put it in quotes, that verse 1. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. You see it's in quotes? Of what yes. you wrote? Yeah, okay. So maybe ESV does a little bit better job with that. All right. So, so we're going to translate this differently. I'll go back to New King James for the sake of argument here. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, so that's the real important statement, each man must have his own life, right? That's why you, and which he says at the, at the end in verse 9, right? You can't exercise self-control, let him marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Have his own wife. That's where, that's, that's where all that creative energy belongs. Or we call it lust, but whatever. <laughs> right? And same for a woman, for a husband. Put it, put it where it belongs, in marriage. Right? All right. Same thing goes with chat, verse 3. The husband must render to his wife the affections, affection due her, which is a nice, kind translation. <laughs> This word, this word affection. How does ESV do it? Verse three, each husband should give his wife her conjugal rights. Okay, well, that's, that's actually a more, much more direct translation. Maybe we should stay with ESV on this first chapter. <laughs> All right. Like, These, um, what's your say, Ron? It doesn't seem like there is some wife swapping going on, huh? <laughs> it's a wild and crazy place. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's probably more just that they had this idea that um, this would happen. Well, this happened in the Old Testament too. You would you would marry your wife, and she would bear you children. But then you would. We talked about this last week, I think. Mm -hmm. But then you would get like a prostitute or a concubine, and you would have like a, what do you call it? like a secondary wife, and she was the one for pleasure. But but so you would. This would happen often in like the upper class of the society. Your your marriage was to the one who you know. You know, like think if you're a king, you'd marry a certain woman as a queen so that you could join two royal houses, for example, right? But then you'd have your affairs on the side because you don't actually, you know, want to have any kind of sexual relationship with her. You just need her for the sake of like, you know, some kind of political union, right? It seems like that's going on, something like that, maybe. Um, or like, you, like, I don't even know. It's hard to know. Uh, but notice it's reciprocal in verse 3. And this is the other thing with marriage um, that we lost sight of, I think, is that, you know, a, a common thing today, what do we have, like the Me Too movement, right? Was a thing, what, a year ago, right? Which was about males' dominance over females. And the, the big case was the, um, the director, well, the producer, I should say. Uh, what was his Harvey name? Weinstein. The, yeah, Harvey Weinstein, that's right. And the way that, like, if you wanted to get a female role in, in the movie, you know, you'd have, he would force some kind of, you know, sexual relationship with him in order to gain that advantage, right? Which is terrible and it's abhorrent, right? Um, oh, there's, there's somebody else I know. All right, welcome. The other thing is, um, though, that this even happens within marriage, and it happens even within Christian marriages, where, where the husband is like, you no, know, you know, you must have relationship with me, right? But he doesn't actually ask her, what do you want, right? Um, instead, they just kind of talk past each other. And, and they, they don't recognize that what God has joined together, you know, he calls one flesh. You're in one flesh union. And that means that these rights, these conjugal rights, as ESV says it, um, you know, it's reciprocal. Um, the, the man isn't the dominant and the, and the woman is the submissive, it's that, that you're actually equal partners in this and that you submit to each other, uh, especially in this regard. Of course, the husband is the head of the home, um, but that's not the same as the head actually serves uh, the body. Uh, is, that's the picture that Paul uses in Ephesians 5. And then he does the same thing here in verse 4. 
The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. But likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. <laughs> uh, so uh, what was I going to say about this? There was a different uh, slant that I could uh, yeah, go for it, Ron. add to here. Um, this came out when we were down in Venezuela, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were situations where this happened where a man had a girlfriend on the side or other, yeah, right, right. other partners. And we talked to one of the wives about it one time. And she said, no, I don't mind. I, I think of him as more of a manly man, more of a, um, a stud, you know. Yeah, yeah, like a horse, and right. She didn't. I mean, that might have just been an excuse that uh, she was saying that, but that's think, what she indicated, you know. I think that's true in Latin American culture, um, mm -hmm. more broadly speaking. I don't know if it's true in every country, but I've heard that elsewhere too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just like, well, that's just who he is. You know, he's got to sow his oats and that kind of thing. It's like, as long as he takes care of her, then it's all cool. And we don't have to know each other and talk to each other. Very weird. Very weird. I just can't imagine that goes well. I don't think it probably does. All right. Um, so don't deprive one another. You notice how Paul does that, right? It's like, this is totally reciprocal. And, and here's the point that I was going to make that I think he's actually been making throughout the book so far. And it's really going to ramp up as we get later on in the book is that you live a life. I think about how Luther puts it in the post communion collect. So the collect after the Lord's supper that we live in faith toward God and love for one another. And there's nothing in that prayer. And there's really the Bible teaches it is that you don't live for yourself. You live you live for your neighbor, and by living for your neighbor, you live for God. That's and what you want and what you care about. It doesn't actually matter. It doesn't matter. Um, you have to ask, what does your neighbor need from you? What does your wife need from you? What do your children need from you? What does your congregation need, you know, from you? You know, what does your pastor need from you if you're a hearer of the word? Or if, you know, your pastor, what do your hearers need from you, right? And that's, that's, what, you, that's what you do. You give to them. And you, the only way you can do that, of course, is if you ask. You know, what can I do for you? you know, um, but, the, but note that you live for one another. So you're 100% in for your neighbor. Or in the case of marriage here, you know, husband for his wife, wife for his husband. And, and not thinking of himself, but only thinking of her. He, and she doesn't think for herself. She only thinks for him. And that, I mean, it's really, it's the most egalitarian view of marriage that you can possibly, that you'll find anywhere in the world. And it's right here in, in St. Paul's letter. It's, it's the only faith that actually teaches this because everyone else has a hierarchical view of marriage that um, not in a sense of orderliness, like the Bible teaches, but in a sense of dominance and submission or, or power and weakness. And that's not what's going on here at all. Um, he does say that you can abstain, you know, from sexual relations or conjugal rights, as they say in prison, I guess, right? <laughs> you get conjugal rights. Um, do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. All right. So, so you know, in service of uh, a faith, right? You know, we're going to pray instead. And then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Right? Tempt you to what? Any of the things that Ron was talking about, right? Or the things that I mentioned before. Whatever it might be. You know, temple prostitute or pornography or... Um, you know, the, the girl you have on the side or, you know, or the, the guy, um, you know, that you have the hots for at work or whatever it is, right? Why would, you, why would you set yourself up to be tempted by not indulging in the thing that God has actually given to you to be used within marriage? Because that's what it's for. That's what it's for. That's what it's been given to you for. It's um, the, like the medieval Roman church, because they emphasize celibacy, then actually taught that all sex was, was sinful and that, and that marriage was sinful and that it had to ha you had to have the sacrament of marriage. You had to actually have the marriage blessed by the priest or it would just be a sinful marriage and there'd be no blessings. Or like, no, actually marriage was given as part of God the, create, God the Father, the creator, making all things. We are made to be married and he blesses not just Christian marriages, but everybody's marriage gets blessed. <laughs> they get, they're given children, they're they're provided for, they care for one another. You, know? you don't have to be a Christian to receive the blessings of marriage. But if you're a Christian, you uniquely understand marriage as both a gift from God 
and then also this 100% reciprocal relationship that marriage um, should be, ought to be. So notice, like I said, these are all imperative, imperative. You must, well, I don't like ESV here either. You should, he should, <laughs> to her husband, no, just say must. It's command, it's part, of, it's the what you're made for. Um, you know, why, I don't know why they translate that as subjunctive when it's imperative. Probably because of the world we live in, you know. I don't want to get people upset reading this. <laughs> All right. Like here, it's, it's very obvious that this is imperative because it also has the negating not, right? Do not deprive one another. That's obviously a command, right? Except perhaps. So there's an exception. All right. So notice this is all command language. And then in, in verse 6, then he shifts. And I told you, the grammar here is really essential, I think, to understand the difference between what he commands and then and what he, how are you going to say this, what he suggests, or we would call it, you know, pastoral direction, I guess, or maybe even just apostolic direction. He doesn't have a word from, from Jesus, but he has some, what he considers very good advice. Does that make sense? I see yes. some head notes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he says it as a, con <laughs> as a concession, not a command, I say this. So the thing he's going to say now, he doesn't have a word from Jesus to back him up. Everything he said up to here, we can quote all sorts of scripture, you know, to prove the same thing. You know, I just roll over it and you can see they pop up. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, Satan tempting, you know, their first Thessalonians 5, right? All sorts of other apostolic or, or you know, Old Testament scripture. But here he says, nope, I don't have it for this. I wish that all of you were as I myself am, that is unmarried. And you say, it's not a command, but it's a concession. And, I, and again, I think this is a, t a time, this is a timely thing. He's saying right now, it's probably be just good if you're not married. If, especially if it's, that, if it's a situation like the famine that we talked about, or even if you just want to go with, you know, Corinth is a mi messy, mixed up place. The, the, the sexual morality is out of control. And just maybe just stay away from that whole world <laughs> for a while, okay? But notice what he says. He has this, this strong, you know, this negating here. But each has his own gift from God, one of a kind and one of another, right? So like we said all the way in verse 24, stay where you are or be who you've been given to be. We'll say it that way. So, I mean, if, if you're given to be married, then marry. If you've been given to be single, then be single right? And it's not, it's not greater or less. It's not, um, one's not more of a Christian or less than a Christian based off of whether they've been given a spouse or not. And we, I mean, we have to be careful about that because we want to extol the gift of marriage, but we also want to recognize that there's no command in the Bible, um, well, in the New Testament anyway, uh, to marry. And by the way, I don't think it's in the Old Testament either. I think it's just commended there as a gift as well. Um, but it is the de facto thing. Um, speaking of which, this is a fun little side note. So the rabbis, I'm not going to be able to find this, but the rabbis um, at the time of Jesus, they actually had instructions as to how often, depending on what job you had, you were supposed to give your wife conjugal rights. Or you, she was supposed to give them to you. I think it was that way around. So if you, I, I can't remember this. If you, were, if you were a seafarer, then you were required by rabbinical law to have conjugal rights once a month. So you had to go to port at least once a month. Okay. <laughs> um, if you were a day laborer, I think it was like a, twice a week. Um, <laughs> they, 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 they had rules for everything. And so that was that, you know? And, and here Paul's like, no, you're not free to despise this gift. It's given to you, so receive it. All right, and that's what he says here too. All right. I know this is fun stuff. <laughs> we just don't talk about it because maybe it isn't fun or easy. To the unmarried and the widows, now we're going to change. Here's another topic. So they, they probably asked him about it. What do we do about unmarried or widows? I, I say that it's good for them to remain single as I am. But again, and here this is all under concession, not command. Uh, if they can't exercise self-control, then they should marry. For it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Or as he said before, or that's what we read. We read that before. All right. Ding. Somebody got a message or something. 
that is um so that is dad's phone you could probably turn that off for him <laughs> <Good mute. laughs> all right um, we're not gonna get let, let's see if we can just cover this these next few verses because i think he's covering a lot of the same material well this other topic actually is kind of big let's just do a couple more verses and then we'll come back to the rest of it uh next time to the married i give this charge not i but the lord okay so you see how he did that now we're not doing this concession but now we're back to a charge back to a command right and why because this is from the lord not from him right so we've talked about this a lot in bible class but i always have to say you know this is my opinion i'm only speaking here you know just or this is conjecture or i'm speculating right but then when I said, no, here's what Jesus said, that's a very different thing, right? So that you can clearly distinguish, like, like Don and I were talking, and Karen and I were talking about before we started, you know, how do you trust somebody? What, how can you trust somebody's authority? Well, they have to speak with authority when they have authority, but when they don't have authority to speak, then they just shut up. Or, or they just say, you know what, this is just my opinion. It doesn't really matter, right? But we don't have that ability to discriminate, it seems like, anymore societally. So the president speaks, you know, from the Oval Office with a letter and he puts a signature on it. We treat that the same as he spoke to a reporter on an airplane offhand. We do the same thing with the Pope, right? The Pope just casually said something on the airplane and now it's the God's honest truth. And you're like, in the Roman church, it's not true. Unless he's sitting in the chair in St. Peter's Basilica, it doesn't count. <laughs> it's true. That's the Roman church's, that's their doctrine. If he's ex cathedra from the chair then it counts but unless he's sitting in that chair it's just him talking like a you know like in any other pastor you know we just it's a maybe misspeak sometimes or you're just like you know what maybe we'll just bless same-sex marriages and you're like what but then when he sits down in the chair he wouldn't dare say that because it's not the church won't go for it so we don't have the, i don't know why we can't do that but it's like i think it's just that we're always trying to signal like we're smarter than you or you know, you're an idiot or whatever it is. It doesn't matter who we're talking about, just somebody in authority. And we want to kind of stick it to them and try to catch, catch him in the act. Who's the guy? Oh, Jimmy Fallon, right? He's going to lose his, his late night TV show because he did one skit on SNL back in 2001 where he was wearing blackface. So he was, he was doing an impression of a, of, a, of a black man, but he's not a black man. So he, so he had black makeup on. And he did it. It, it was a funny impression. And the comedian i think that he was making you know that he was doing the impression of they thought it was great um but then snl you know they cut it from the archives and you couldn't watch it online but then somebody discovered it now he's going to get run off the air because he did an impression that was perfectly not perfect but it probably was only kind of acceptable at the time but it wasn't going to get you off the air and today it's like no everything he's ever done now is invalid and he's a terrible man and, you know like one lapse of judgment maybe or some you know just taking something out of, out of context really weird but we do that so here paul is careful to make sure that they understand no 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 now i'm going to say something again this is from the lord and again this is now imperative voice actually passive infinitive what's even more okay so the wife should not separate from her husband all right so you know let, what god has joined together let not man separate that's the word from the lord right <laughs> So no divorce. God hates divorce. How does he say it? Malachi 2, 16. The Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Right? I'm not saying that there is no divorce, but we're saying, what does God say about it? Bad, right? The one who divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. Whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. All right, Jesus, Sermon on the Mount. But if she does... So presumably she already has at this point. I was trying to talk to that kind of case. She should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, if possible, I guess is what we would say. And the husband should not divorce his wife. Same story. So why is that in parentheses? Oh, but if she does, because we love things to be in parentheses. Oh, but there's always the escape clause, right? <laughs> All right, let's see what King James, New King James does. Uh, I command you but not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband, but if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. 
but if that's how they do it without the parentheses they use the but for the de, day okay so it's it's a greek grammatical it's a particle that can mean but or it can indicate what do they call it indirect discourse i don't know why i remember that but i remember that from greek class 14 years ago so it's called indirect discourse because yeah and aorist passive infinitive with the day okay anyway um so you could you could do it parenthetically like that or you could do it like like new king james does it you can do it either way okay yeah let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband now that's a rough thing to say to someone uh to a woman especially even in the greek the roman or greek world because unless she's wealthy she you know this this is not going to put her in a position where she's going to be cared for you know unless she happens to be a noble woman or she happens to be you know well then she's like or she's wealthy or probably both you know it's not going to go well for her uh, that's why like paul commends um the church to care for widows in particular right so that they don't end up in a situation where they they have to resort to sexual immorality in particular to um, provide for themselves so let her remain unmarried or reconcile to her husband. Now, again, I think we talked about this, but it is a good one to end, good place to end, because I said that we live in a world where this is not a real popular teaching. And uh, when it comes to divorce and remarriage, because uh, now, well, how, how long has it been? Has it been 50 years that we've had no fault divorce? Did that go came in the 70s right <coughs> or was it before that no it wasn't before that no i think it's in the 70s that 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 was passed that you could you could divorce for no no reason no fault which when is interesting up, when i was growing up i didn't know anyone who was divorced no and i think part of the problem is is that we do want to recognize that um there are um, situations where divorce is like you know the last resort um, especially, you know, uh, health or safety. Um, I would suggest that what Paul says here is probably the most most biblically counseled way to go about this. Um, it, I mean, it's hard, but to say you separate, I think that's what we call it, you're separated, but you remain unmarried. Um, especially if you have children, if there's children involved, because uh, otherwise, what do we call that? Mixed marriage? No, not mixed marriages blended family right blended families like how many who do i call dad who do i call mom you know and some of those i've seen situations which i mean i would say they do a beautiful job navigating it um but it's 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 not easy and i think it ultimately confuses the kids especially as far as teaching what marriage is and that's why we you know paul is commending well he would commend himself as being an example of celibacy and I think, you know, he wants to be able to commend the church as being an example of, of marriage to say, here's a way that you can live within marriage and for it to be, you know, uh, noble or whatnot. Well, this, this would be one of those uh, commands that applies to, to Christians, to, yep. not to non-Christians. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we can't control what the state does. Um, but we can choose as a church whether to recognize those divorces or not. And like the Roman church actually required to remain a Roman Catholic, you have to have your marriage annulled, which is a fancy technical legal way for them to get around divorce by saying, well, you never really were married. <laughs> You're like, but that's not biblical. <laughs> <laughs> no, they made that up. But it's like, well, how do you do that? Oh, well, you know he never believed in marriage and he was never he only he was a fake catholic and now he's you know or something i i don't know how to do it all right so um i actually have an i think a helpful footnote on this whole topic and it's from the uh a document from the commission on theology and church relations of the lutheran church missouri synod uh, they have a document called divorce and remarriage i think it was from 1985 maybe i think that's when it was published um and that's because you know we live they there was a question that was asked of them and that's a committee that has some lay people but it has professors from both seminaries and has i think some pastors and the president of the senate and some other people sit on it so the question that was asked of the ctcr as we call them was this 
What response is to be given to those who, after an unscriptural divorce, meaning not in the case of sexual immorality, desire to remarry, declaring that they are unable to restore a previously broken marriage and expressing their intention to amend their sinful lives? So what do we do if their divorce was unjust or not outside of what the Bible allows, which is very little? Actually, Moses, Jesus says that Moses only allowed for a certificate of divorce because of the hardness of your heart. So even Moses was like, I can't deal with this. I'll just give you a certificate. That's what Jesus said. <laughs> Which is crazy. Here's what, here's what they said. In cases of remarriage of persons divorced for reasons not biblically sanctioned, true repentance would presuppose a genuine desire to reconcile with one's estranged spouse. It is difficult to imagine, for example, how genuine contrition, that is sorrow over sin, can exist or how absolution can be announced when there is a... a is present a refusal to seek healing of the marriage, where the refusal to reconcile and to seek healing is judged to be absent insofar as the judgment is possible, the pastor will be constrained to deny a request for remarriage. Right? So they do allow there to say, well, look, if, the, if you're trying to reconcile to your spouse, but they've already remarried someone else. Like, how are you going to reconcile now? You know? And that happens often, right? Because there's an affair, and then you, div you separate or you divorce, and then he marries the person he had the affair with, or she does. All right. That yeah. happened in the Old Testament, too. Uh, yeah, I know it did. <laughs> was it Hosea, or was it... Uh, well, Hosea was commanded to. We talked about that. He was commanded to marry the prostitute. Well, then, it was a, then it was a different one. It was a problem. No, I, I mean, just think of uh, uh, Jacob, right? You know, he marries well, was, the wrong gal, and then it's like, the, um, he doesn't divorce her. Israel, when they were in Babylon, married foreign wives, and when they came back... Oh, right. They were required to to right. separate from those. Right, right. And under Jewish law, that's true. This comes up later in the chapter. Uh, mm -hmm. And Paul actually says, don't, no. Um, you know, and if they want to leave, you can let them leave. But, um, but you don't initiate the divorce as, a, as the believer because of what you believe about marriage. It's the witness to them in the world. Anyway, there are circumstances, however. <laughs> so this is the parentheses. You ready for this? There are where there are reasons to believe that true repentance is indeed present, but where reconciliation and restoration of a broken marriage simply are not possible, because, either because the former spouse has remarried or is unwilling to be reconciled. In such cases, remarriage becomes a possibility, I guess. Considerable caution must be exercised by pastors, however, lest they, what, what may be considered possible under exceptional circumstances come to be interpreted as license to disregard God's will in this regard. So the so the exception becomes the rule, right? By no means may encouragement be given to go on sinning that grace may abound, Romans 6, right? So, um, this, yeah, this is a hard one to navigate because you have the Lord's word and then you have sinful hearts, right? And, um, you know, I mean, we can't, as a pastor, I can't even get away with telling parents, I've had this happen to me and I know it's happened, you know, in the area and I, other pastors, it's probably happened to every pastor at this point, to say, well, you know, both parents, the parents of the bride and the parents of the groom, both are like, you know what, they've been living together for a couple of years, and I know, what, I know what you've been saying about, like, don't live like you're married until you're actually married, but, you know, that's how kids are these days, just, just look the other way. Now, what am I supposed to do, especially if the parents are in the church, right, and they sanctioned it? In my situation, the one the one that I'm thinking of in particular from Indiana, the parents are the ones who, who actually bought them the house that they were living in, right? It's like, do I just say no marriage for you? I, I tried to say, let's get married now. They didn't go for it. I, I tried really hard to just say, you're already living as husband and wife. I don't know why, we're, why you're play acting. Can we just declare this? What it already, just go to the, I, I think I almost got them to just go to the judge and just get the marriage thing and then have the ceremony you know, in the blessing, like in the summer or something. But, you know, you just, you feel like you're just talking to a wall. People who, for whatever reason, and maybe it wasn't exemplified in their life, or maybe it's the effect of the world we live in. This, this teaching is just like, um, I don't know, like a foreign language. Mm -hmm. And you want to hold the line. Um, and, and maybe, maybe the reason, one of the reasons we can't hold the line is because, or we have a hard time doing it, I should say, 
um, is because a lot of the, th this isn't the only thing that is countercultural in the church, but um, many of our churches have embraced so much of what they see in the world around them that there is no, when you get to the countercultural stuff, um, it just seems out of place. You know, if you, if you can go to, if you go to church and everything looks and behaves like what you would get at the, oh, I don't know, maybe it's like a combination of, of the rock club and the YMCA and your kid's school, right? And it's all just kind of mixed together. And so you have a gym and you've got, you know, schooling for the kids and maybe you have, a, you have, you know, exercise stuff and you've got, and then you've got a little concert event that you get to go to and maybe you have some self-help classes. And like, and then the church comes along and says, well, but we do have this thing about marriage, <laughs> you know, about sexual relationships or we have the, or we have this thing about, um, idolatry, right. Or other kinds of immorality. It, it's usually moral issues. And then it's like, Whoa, how dare you talk to me that way? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it, it, maybe that, maybe that is very contemporary to what we have today. Right. Because. Um, Paul is dealing with everything that's going on in Corinth and the way that then it's spinning out in the life of the people and the, and the life of the people is running up, like up against uh, what the scripture teaches and they don't see it. They don't see the conflict and he's bringing that conflict to light for them um, in, in pretty strong terms. Any other thoughts on this? I knew we wouldn't get through it all. I'd like to believe we could, but. I have too many things to say. <laughs> is this new to you? I think we should read this at marriages. <laughs> this I is heard, a, um, heard a sermon by this, um, I think it was earlier this week. Um, what's the name of that pastor I mentioned before? Oh, um, the, the Scottish Presbyterian guy? Yeah, Beggs. You know, um, Forget his first name, but last name is Bacon. Mm -hmm. uh, he was talking about this very thing about how if we're going to obey the Bible, you know, you, you need to obey the whole thing, right. not just the things that you, you want. The things you so, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, God says very clearly what what the procedure is if if there's a fracture in a marriage or whatever. Right. Right. We, don't, we don't follow that at all anymore. Right. And like I, like I said here, I mean, I, want, I, I do think we have to be careful and recognize that like 10 and 11, Paul is very clear to say, this is pastoral counsel. It's wise, um, but it's not from the Lord directly. It's just from him as an apostle, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas that first part, you know, verses one through eight, I mean, this is all under, uh, this is all command language. He's using the imperative voice. This is not a suggestion. This is, this is what we do. You know, like, like if you want to live together and you want to have a relationship with each other, then you need to marry because that's what, that's what Jesus teaches. And if you want to quote, quote Paul here for do it, you can do that, you know, however you want to go about it. Um, well, that's what we do. In, in God's eyes, they're already married. Well, yeah, no, it's true. I mean, they know each other in the Old Testament sense, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's just simple. If you can't exercise self-control, you know, well, then make it legitimate. Now, this gets pastors into trouble. You know, I have a pastor friend who married, married uh, two young people that he knew they weren't really probably the right people for each other, but, um, but they were already live, living as husband and wife and um, somehow convinced mom or grandma, I guess, or well, would be grandma later on. Anyway, turns out he ended up in prison. Um, I don't know, for a few years or something like that. You know, and it fractured that relationship between the pastor and, and that family. She resented him for it. It's like she was, he was part of the problem. She, he put her daughter in, in this situation, you know, where she's married to a, a convict. And it's like, well, you can't win either, you know, for trying here. I mean, there's just, you want to speak the truth, speak it in love. Um, you don't make accommodations where God doesn't, you, but you do accommodate as he does. You know, make concessions where you where you can, you know, and uh, let it be. And yeah, I don't know, that's going to make some people upset because it hits close to home, right? How dare you talk about my you know kids that way? It's always the parents who are upset. 
the kids are the ones who are willing to listen. It's, and it's the parents who aren't. And you're like, well, why don't you, if your parents had just said it to you, then it wouldn't be a problem. If they put their foot down, the pastor would have an easy job. But no, no, it's the parents who are wrong. So, so again, maybe, well, yeah, don't shy away from the topic. Have a Wednesday evening Bible study where you look at First Corinthians and talk about it, you know, and then, um, but then also demonstrate it, you know, within the congregation and within our marriages, you know, how, how this life of service, you know, for one another. Because um, it's a beautiful thing, too, and I think people will see the beauty of it. Um, I could give you more anecdotes, but that we're already running a little longer than I wanted to, so. Good. Um, somebody who's got like a bookmark or something. Remember that we left off at verse 12. And, that, and I'm glad we didn't talk about this part because this is also very unpopular and probably we need to tease it out a little bit. All right. Any other questions? If you, if you missed the first part, uh, you know, mom and Don, or not Don, didn't, Ron, Ron and mom, whatever, rhymes. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll post it on YouTube so you can you can catch up on the first part. There, sure. There's some important lead in there that I think, well, you might, I think I referenced and you might have caught as we went there, but um, we'll help because it'll also help for the next week too. I have All a right. question okay. before. Yeah. We close uh, in regard to having the service on Sunday. Yeah. Are we, we going to have a, a group cleanup sometime during Saturday or when? Uh, what the what the council discussed, and I could let Don answer this, but I'll answer for him. Let Don, unless Don wants to answer, I'll let Don answer. Don, you answer. <laughs> Ron, 9 a.m. on Saturday morning, we're meeting to clean. Well, I guess I remember now. That's what we said. said yeah. yeah, right. And then, and then, as far as ongoing cleanup, the regular cleaning crew, you know, whoever you know is assigned, and then they can. Um, we just have a, some extra materials and things to do. So. It's just a little bit of additional cleanup after the service. So, yeah, I never, I never thought about turning that heat off in the friendship room this year. Yeah, I don't. I just walked in there. I'm like, I don't think it's supposed to be this warm in here. <laughs> I don't know why it didn't turn off. The thermostats were both turned down. I had thought about turning it off earlier, but then it was only getting down to it was going down to 35 at night. Oh yeah. And so I, I forgot all about it. I noticed it too, but I didn't know how to turn it off. <laughs> no, because the thermostats are turned down. That's actually that's, the switch. The switch on the furnace in the basement. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's fine. We don't need the heat on anymore. Woo right. All right. Good. Well, let's uh, close with the prayer. Heavenly Father, you have given us in your word a wonderful um, picture of how you have made us and how you would have us live according to that according to that word. We ask that you'd send your Spirit upon us that we would live together in relationships that you have placed us in and that we would be faithful there um, and stay put in those relationships as you would have us do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Pastor, I don't know if you know, but um, my brother David was taken into the hospital last